Okay, so Caleb Kibet is a bioinformatics researcher, lecturer, and an open science advocate and mentor. He's currently doing his postdoc, uh, postdoc research at ECPE. ECPE is International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology, for those who don't know. Uh, it's, it's based in Kenya. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, so Caleb is here. Yeah, so he's currently doing his postdoc at ECPE, and he also teaches bioinformatics at Kwan University. Uh, he was a former Mozilla Open Science Fellow that was in 2019 and 2020. He is also a member of the DIRAD Scientific Advisory Board and also a board member for the uh, Open Bioinformatics Foundation, OBF. And if you haven't uh, seen that, I think you should check it out. They give grants for people to travel to conferences and all that. But you need to apply so they just don't give you the grants. Okay, so he's also a founder of Open Science KE, which is an initiative that promotes open approaches to bioinformatics research in Kenya. He is passionate about open science and reproducible uh, bioinformatics research and continuously seeks opportunities that would spread open science, especially within the bioinformatics community in Africa. Caleb is also involved in bioinformatics capacity building through the Human Hereditary and Health in Africa, uh, that is H3 Africa uh, Bioinformatics Network. And here he leads Open Science Project and also the Eastern Africa Network for Bioinformatics Training. Most of you might have heard of that, that EMD uh, program. So welcome, Caleb. Uh, if you can hear my voice, uh, you can just go ahead and share your screen. If you have slides uh, or just uh, thank you, Ruth. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Fred, please mute your mic. Okay. Yeah, uh, please proceed, Kelly. Perfect. Uh, Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm from the Kitan Yuan. So you can see, but you keep breaking. Your voice keeps breaking. Yes. Yeah. Is it better now? Uh, I just want to confirm it. Yeah, yeah, it's better now. Okay. Hey, just for your information, guys, it's recorded. Uh, so hope everyone is fine with that. Uh, which screen is it sharing? Is it sharing? Is the correct one? Uh, okay, so uh, thank you uh, for the introduction, Ruth, and uh, really uh, grateful for the opportunity to just uh, share my story. And uh, I won't really I'd talk a little bit and then we can have a conversation uh, around most of the other things. Uh, just provide a very quick introduction to my journey to uh, bioinformatics and generally my science journey and how I, how I found myself in science. So I'll I call it towards a vision and really the reason for that is that my interest in science surprisingly started in high school. When I was in high school, uh, I remember 
you know, my desk I had written in front of my desk, uh, Dr. Dr. Kibet at that time, which uh, was quite interesting. But I think my interest really was not uh, Dr. Kibet as a bi as a as a PhD holder. Rather, I probably was thinking about medicine. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a vision. There was an interest towards something. Uh, and that vision has been what has continually been my journey towards that. So I'll start here. This is who I am that now, maybe not with a dirty trouser in the bush, but uh, that's part of who I am as well. So I'm a bioinformatician based at ICPA, and I am involved in one within ICPA as, as an organization and two other specific projects, the H3 Bionet and Ian Bit. Uh, I'm also involved in open science, a lecturer, a member of those boards, and so forth. That's what I'll be talking about, how I got there. And this is really my journey at a very high level. So I was born and raised in, in Keio, uh, in the Rift Valley. Uh, all my primary school and high school education was in that particular region, in, 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 in in Keio district. And my upbringing, I'll just to just talk about this, was I was brought up in a uh, strongly Christian family, uh, very strong work ethics. I remember growing up, my, so initially in primary school, I used to go to school uh, just across the river. And uh, over lunchtime, we used to we'd run home and the, the thing you'd be doing is first of all, you have to feed the cows, uh, get some uh, napier grass for the cows and uh, get that done, get to eat and run back to school uh, a bit of a distance. Just uh, you go through the river, up the hill into school. And then after some time, move to another school, which now I had to cross two, two rivers to get to school. And that means you have, you go uphill twice. And uh, that used to take, if you run really fast, I think uh, the record at that time, we used to do it in uh, in 12 minutes was the record. And that was really when you go really fast. Uh, but it was quite some distance because uh, I had to, I would leave two or three schools uh, that could say would be two other schools that would be nearer uh, compared to the other. And the reason for that is that my my dad was an, an educator. My dad was uh, an, a primary school teacher. He was the teacher in the school that I was attending. And, and therefore, he always had this in mind that he always wanted to have his children studying in the same school that he's teaching. And in that, is if he's going to make the school to do well, he'd be able to uh his kids are there so there's always that aspect and that kind of uh i guess that's where teaching and uh, uh mentorship also came from uh came from my parents the the mentorship that i received from my parents and what my parents were involved in as as teachers and and therefore all through primary school my dad was teaching me mathematics uh, so he was just, he was our maths teacher uh, in standard eight, and I used to enjoy mathematics, and he was really strict, <laughs> especially, I'd say he was more stricter to us uh, than others, I would say, uh, in that he'd always expect for you to take initiative and do the best and be able to shine in that. And he knew the potential that we had and he ensured that that potential was achieved uh, through our studies. And he wanted to be able to show by example and uh, lead by example and ensuring that uh, we are actually doing well in that. So as my maths teacher, Alessia, uh, stories and how strict he was in in that even if he knew that I was not in school on that day because I was feeling unwell or so forth, the next day would want, you'd want to check that I've been able to catch up with what was taught in the previous day and you'd want to ask me a question that was done in the previous day, which I found quite interesting. And so 
that's you could say uh, that's where my interest continually within mathematics and the sciences uh, to some level started. I think I had English and Swahili was not something that I enjoyed or uh, did quite well in those subjects, but yeah, I didn't do well and my handwriting was terrible. I think my as teachers are always talking about my handwriting being really bad. That's not the story. Uh, continued, went to high school and now in high school that's where I had interest in science, doing all the subjects and getting into uh, second year, choosing all sciences uh, because of that. And of course, also it's around that time that uh, that interest in getting into science and the motivation was always the mentors that would come and talk about uh, various careers and get to guide us in uh, the various career directions. They would elect uh, lawyers and I studied in St. Patrick's High School, D10. Uh, lawyers, scientists, not scientists, really doctors that would, would come. And within those periods, I would now start an interest, that interest that I talk, just talked about in getting into uh, becoming a doctor, I guess, was a doctor in medicine and then did my undergraduate in in biotechnology and I just want to mention here was that when I was getting into uh, we we had that period of after high school we had that period of uh, you could say uh, almost two years where before you join uh, campus uh, that, that that still existed at that time where that top, that time we got into farming and uh, learning a few things, uh, computers and and so forth. But so at that time, I remember uh, I went to the at that time it was the Jepkoilel campus for Mo University to talk to some of the lecturers to really get to learn from them about the various career directions that I could take uh, when it comes to moving into. To university because I was really interested in getting to make a, a decision and a choice that would be appropriate to my interest and to what I want to do. Uh, but it was a bit of a struggle to to figure that out. And I think I talked about at some point I was thinking about chemical engineering, at some point I was thinking about computer science, at some point uh, medicine. But if you look at all the career choices that I had made, I think biotechnology was one of them, but at the top I had uh, uh, communication and information technology as, as the, 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 the choice that I had. But of course, there was those times where you uh, joined that mission board at that time, it was called, I think now the name has changed, would make a decision based on the interest, the demand for that course, and of course the universities that you've chosen. And therefore, for some reason when I went to re- uh, to select for courses, I uh, I selected biotechnology and uh, not with so much of a knowledge, I would say. I knew to some level about it, but uh, in my mind, I thought there was more technology in that uh, than <laughs> than bio, uh, but that was what I was thinking at that time. And so I did the BSc in biotechnology, but my interest in computer science and my interest in IT, because I remember when I was in, in campus, I really worked quite hard to try and change the courses, but that didn't happen. So I ended up in biotechnology uh, in, in Kenyatta University. Uh, that's where I did my, my undergraduate. And in doing biotechnology and through interactions with uh, the course and as well getting to know what it is about, because biotechnology now is just um less about this less about technology but it's more towards uh getting to harness uh more or less uh biological life and get to uh utilize that in uh in adding value to life so you could think about uh in medicine getting to uh figure out how to um when it comes to diseases or getting to prepare vaccines, uh, there's some aspects of of that. In that, in, in that, there's aspects of uh, uh, plants uh, within plants now. Which what is well known there is uh, the genetic modification, and 
uh, genetics was quite uh, an area that uh, was of interest. But my interest in, I'd say, in tech still remained. And in undergraduate second year, that's when uh, some students from ILRI came to uh, to Kenyatta University for some workshops, and that's when they talked about biotech, bioinformatics, and what it entails. And it is at that point that I knew that I was going to do a master's in in bioinformatics. At uh, the point of that uh, presentation from uh, from those students, and from that time on, my preparations and uh, I would say self-learning and seeking out of mentors and guidance has always been in the direction of figuring out how to get into this field, the field of bioinformatics. So within it was within that period that I, I really started uh, reaching out to mentors uh started reaching out to mentors uh to learn more about this particular field and one of the people that i reached out to was uh actually my current boss uh, dr masiga who was based at ICP. he was running he was the president at that time of the african uh computational uh biology and bioinformatics computational biology uh, society african society for computational uh, biology aspcb and in reaching out to him, it took a number of emails until he responded, and I also wanted to become a member of that organization because of my interest in bioinformatics. And when I got an appointment with him, my interest was to learn, to learn about bioinformatics, to learn, and I think the questions I had actually more or less uh, a few questions. One was, I would like to learn about this field. Uh, what does it entail? Uh, what's the status of this field in the country? What are the prospects when it comes to, to this field going forward? What are the opportunities that are in this field? The other uh, question was, given my current stage, uh, the stage of my career that I am at, uh, at that point I'd, I was in my fourth year. Uh, I think I was, yeah, I was in my first, fourth year, uh, second, first semester, moving into second semester. And within that period, given the stage of my career, what should I be doing to prepare myself for a specialization in bioinformatics? And uh, and the other question, of course, was always was on who else should I be talking to? Who else should I be reaching out to? Who else should I be learning more about bioinformatics from? And it is at that time that he, <coughs> there was a number of uh, people in that space. There was uh, currently uh, Roslyn Mashare is currently uh, a lecturer at the University of Nairobi in bioinformatics. So he was doing a bioinformatics project here at ISIPE uh, as, a P as a PhD within the RPS program. Uh, the other person was uh, George Obiero, who was also doing a PhD in bioinformatics. Uh, uh, at that time, they were both registered in the University of Western Cape in, in South Africa, but doing their research at ISIPE. Uh, and then the other person that was in that space was uh, Dr. Mireji, uh, who was now, who was, we had affiliation to CPA, affiliation to Yale, and affiliation to uh, Calro, and at that time it was still, it was still carry, yes, it was still carry at that time. And uh, he was, the, the, the Calro uh, Triptese Research Institute, uh, that's where he was also affiliated. And at that period, uh, without knowing, there was actually a huge international Clocina genome initiatives. Clocina is the is Cesaflies, which is responsible for uh, the sleeping sickness for human beings or Nagana for for animals. And within that project, they had sequenced the genome of one of the of the species, and through. By so from that conversation of the information that I'm interviewing, I got to be introduced to uh, now Dr. Obiero and Rosemary Masharia and uh, Paul Mireji and the conversation now. 
in bioinformatics started. And I went back to campus and continued learning PAL. Uh, I think uh, PAL was the language of choice at that time. I think so PAL was the language of choice at that time, which was uh, so PAL was mostly used was really good for text processing. And if you think about genomics and uh, when the the, the the human genome was sequenced, the, the, the key trouble and the major uh, thing that needed to be figured out was how can we make sense of this information? Now we have a, a puzzle to fill. We have to process all this text, you're talking about billions of uh, letters or for, for those who are not in bioinformatics or billions of nucleotides. And therefore, PAL was a language that was already positioned. It was mostly used by uh, news editors at that time uh, for a, a number of aspects. And therefore, that was adopted uh, within uh, bioinformatics, uh, more or less, at that time in getting to understand the, the human genome and getting to understand uh, the DNA sequences. And so I started learning PAL at that time, uh, which was a language of choice and as guided by the mentors that I was also that I was also working with. Uh, something else within, and I'll get back to this part of the story of, uh, of moving into uh, bioinformatics. So that was the interest in bioinformatics in my second year, moving into uh, PAL and getting to to learn the language on my own at that time, and with just more or less or very little help. So, I just today I was going through my Dropbox. I actually found uh, this presentation that I did. We had uh, this high school science and technology empowerment program conference that we. Uh, organized and I was part of uh, this uh, organization, KSTEP, or at that time, Kenya, Kenya's high, Kenya, it was actually High School Science and Technology Empowerment Program. Uh, so we had this group in in high school, in in, in campus in, in at KU, and we used to go to different high schools and talk about science and technology. I remember we went to uh, Alliance, Tare, and a number of other uh, schools to talk about science. And at this point, we had organized uh, this conference at KU, and I was giving this talk. This was a talk that I was giving at that time. This must have been, I was in fourth year, so uh, I was in fourth year, and uh, this was my title as HCEP Corporate Relations Coordinator at that, at that time. I think we had uh, Alex. Nyargis, uh, we had, uh, who else was, Atena, um, Victoria, and, and many others uh, that uh, Victor and Alex are now in very strongly in genomics and science, and uh, they are now, all Victor has already has a PhD, Alex is finishing up his PhD as well. So this group was interested in building uh, or more or less creating mentorship around science and technology. And this, I was giving this talk, which is based on at that time, choosing career based on personality and, and interest. And our conference theme was scientific simulation for talent development and, and empowerment. So that was what uh, I was up to at that time. So, and a number of other things involved in uh, the Biotechnology Club and the rest. So within now, like the inform informational interviewing was more or less just talking to various people within the field. Uh, at that time also I did my attachment uh, at the uh, National Biosafety Authority uh, after after my undergraduate, so or within my undergraduate, so attachment at the National Biosafety Authority. And um, at that point, the the national biosafety law or the biosafety law had just been passed and the the biosafety law and that as a biotechnologist that was uh, quite an an interesting field and i just want to also just briefly talk about how i got my attachment uh, at that time actually outside the ceo of the national biosafety authority and yes outside the ceo and the technical director 
I was the only other scientist. Uh, I was in my third year of undergraduate at that time. I was the only other, could say, scientist at that uh, organization, and it was just established. And I remember when I was looking for an attachment, where to do my attachment, I saw I saw an advertisement. No, it was actually not an advertisement. It was in a, I was reading a newspaper and I saw the name of the CEO, Roy Mugira, at that time in the newspaper and talking about the National Bus Safety Authority. And therefore, I started Googling him, found his email address, sent him an email uh, to talk to him. I had a chat with him and I think I had a chat with him the previous week. The next week I was already uh, uh, starting my attachment uh, the the national bus safety and i was really involved in a lot at that time because there was no scientists like, building the whole database of all the uh, gmo applications that had been done until until that point and uh i was also involved in as they were hiring now i was involved in just onboarding most of the uh scientists that came to be involved in that but i thought if i wasn't uh, in bioinformatics i think i would have been in in biosafety uh, which was an area that was quite interesting uh back to bioinformatics uh the journey continues uh so after that informational interviewing and just having a conversation with dr masiga and talking to all the other people in in the space uh i was called to isipe uh as more or less, I was also the first intern in bioinformatics at ICPE, which uh, came about through my interest in bioinformatics and also the fact that there was this uh, Closena genome sequencing initiative that was already ongoing. So this is the vector for the African trypanosomiasis, either African human or animal uh, trypanosomiasis. And uh, this was published much, much later on, uh, actually when I was already doing my my MSc afterwards. So this, I was involved in the annotation. Uh, so the annotation is after the sequencing, you want to figure out which kind of genes exist, what the genes do, and can we try and understand the biology of this particular fly based on the genomics, and more or less based on uh, the sequences. Uh, and so my role was in the annotation of one of the gene families in, in this particular species at that time. And it is through my now working with this and learning, started now learning, going to Coursera, learning Python at that time, moving to running to learning Pash and most of the other programming languages that uh, are used in bioinformatics and reading a whole lot uh, within uh, lots of books in, in bioinformatics at that, at that time. And it is through this period and interaction with uh, bioinformatics in, in practice, really, uh, that this, this paper was published and one of these 120 uh, co-authors, they were uh, part, of, part of them. And this opened another opportunity because it was through this period I was doing my, because I started my attachment even before graduating. I just finished coursework. Immediately after finishing coursework, I started my attachment at ICPE of my internship at the CP and that went on until uh, by December that year, I had received, I graduated in December, and by that time I had received an offer to do an MSc in bioinformatics at Rhodes University, a uh, sponsored uh, offer, and that also came out about because of uh, the the interaction at the CP and uh, what I'd been able to, to do and learn at the CP. So my MSc was really in bioinformatics, MSc in bioinformatics at Rhodes University. And the, the MSc that I was involved in was mostly involved in gene regulation. So the MSc program, uh, my supervisor was based in computer science. And what we were interested in doing at that time was uh, getting to understand the role of uh, transcription binding, so transcription factors. So if you look at all genomes and most genomes, the number of genes compared to the number of uh, really functionality and what is being always being expressed, uh, it's not always just similar and the, num the functionality. So there's always the off-on switch, uh, so uh, increasing the expression or repressing based on a particular other protein that does the that controls what is being expressed 
uh, at any particular point and or at any, any particular cell. So it's dif different cells would need different proteins at different level, at different stages of development. They would need different genes or different proteins, if you may. Uh, so based on those needs and the fact that each cell contains all like more or less within each cell you have the same genetic information in all the cells, but then the role and the differentiation of any particular cell is dependent on that regulation. So the regulatory machinery now within that, so from moving from DNA to RNA as you move down, is controlled by this other protein called transcription factors, which bind or more or less they stick to a particular region uh, here to now regulate now the expression of the protein and of course the structure, the functional structure is always in that 3D conformation. So that's what you are and that when that process breaks down or doesn't work as expected, you have several diseases that come up. So for example, most of the cancers are actually uh, due to the breakdown of that uh, of that regulation. And I was involved in the chronic myeloid leukemia, getting to explore if we could be able to identify markers just based on uh, the regulatory process and just trying to compare the regulation of those with cancer and those without cancer. Then we're working with cell and uh, a data set called Gypsic. And that's what I was involved in during my, my MSc. Can you still? Yes, Najala? I'm actually not speaking. I think someone has a muted their mic. Uh, uh, let's see. I think they need to this is okay. That's it. Sorry. All right. Thanks. So I'll just speed up. So that's yeah, that's the what I was doing in my MSc and my PhD was a continuation of that, but now caring to bring much, much bigger uh, types of data sets and building machine learning models for uh, predicting where that particular, so the prediction is really complex because where any particular transcription factor would bind to could be degenerate, which means there's very huge variations of, of that. If you can look at this, uh, this is how complex it can look like. So, so my role was to now bring all these various evidence from the genomics and uh, the shape of the DNA to chip seek data and most of these data sets to build models. And the other aspect was to build a platform for uh, getting to more or less uh, one, assess the quality of the models that you are generating. And I'll really not go in depth on that. And it was within my PhD that I started exploring also open science, the uh, collaborative research, uh, uh, publishing openly data, software, and so forth. And of course, due to my involvement using uh, machine learning, I started also data science became my interest at that point. And I uh, started getting involved a whole lot in hackathons and challenges. And that's how I was able to own my skills in, in machine learning. One of them was the Dream Challenge. Started following very interesting people in different spaces in data science, in regulatory genomics, in bioinformatics, and open science as well. And, and that's how more or less when I finished my PhD coming, coming back to Kenya, my interest actually was always to come back to Kenya and be involved in capacity building. So if you've been listening, you'd notice that mentorship has had a particular role there, teaching has also had a particular aspect. And then now bringing on board now bioinformatics is also being one of my interests. So capacity building, bioinformatics, uh, data science, uh, open science also uh, started also becoming one of the areas that I was involved in and that's where I get, got to found when I came back to uh, found this group and this was about came about because of my uh, a Mozilla, Mozilla Science mini grant that we received to uh, build advocacy around uh, open science and bioinformatics within within the country. So we formed it was a group of scientists, researchers, promote open science practices in bioinformatics. So promoting open, collaborative, and reproducible uh, bioinformatics research uh, in Kenya. And then got back to my uh, the organization ECP. That's where I started also getting involved in leading 
uh, bioinformatics research and genomic data management and with that vision of just have creating a vibrant productive innovative and that flexible bioinformatics training so you could see training research and genomic data analysis was always uh, some of the principles and uh, one my, my roles and i'll just talk about this very privily is just provide sufficient infrastructure for computing within the organization uh, develop workflows for analyzing genomic data uh, build a bioinformatics capacity and of course getting to establish different research programs in, in bioinformatics and this uh, some of the projects that we involved in one Ian Bitt and H3 Bionet are uh, you involved in training and capacity building so we have students PhD students interns that we train uh, we build now the reproducibility from collection of samples in the field we have the laboratory information management system uh, genomic data management workflows for the analysis and of course research now that comes from the various genomic projects that we have involved in that we're involved in within the within the center within capacity building I'm involved in there's Shebanet, uh, there are a number of training initiatives that we run there. Uh, the East African Network for Bioinformatics Training. Uh, we also uh, have a number of uh, initiatives there, the MSc program and the residential training, and we've been able to build huge capacity. We now training, we run several trainings uh, within that, with one of really uh, flagship project was the Bioinformatics uh, Incubation and Mentorship Program that uh, we got to establish to train uh, those who are interested in bioinformatics to venture into this space. So as uh, someone completes their undergraduate studies and they want to get into bioinformatics, uh, building, uh, upskilling them to be able to, to prepare them for uh, specialization in bioinformatics. Uh, through that, uh, just play slightly as I finish. So come back to this. So that's where I am and we've got we teaching GQuad, uh Genetic University Bioinformatics at that time and being involved in advocacy, getting into becoming a bioinformatician. And then I moved into through the open science, I became a Mozilla Open Science Fellow. And within that fellowship, we were interested in one research data management, ensuring that uh, especially within genomics and just building a framework for uh, managing genomic data. And then got into being a postdoc at CIPE uh, afterwards. And the journey, the journey really continues. And we've been able to do a lot of things and build within building capacity. We've had quite a number of students trained and uh, mentored through the various initiatives and programs that I'm involved in. H3 Bionet, uh, it also ran the Open Science project within that, and we are able to train uh, within Open Science and Bioinformatics across across the continent, being involved in different initiatives with Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya, uh, which really emanated from one of our programs, and uh, quite proud of the various achievements and uh, the growth that we get to see, which is what really brings a lot of satisfaction uh, uh, to me. And I think uh, I've talked a lot i've uh, just noticed and i think i'll just stop there and we can uh take questions and just have a conversation yeah thank you so much um so now we if you have any questions for him just raise your hand or just type in the chat box and then i'll, I'll read, read out the questions in the meantime um Caleb, you have been so successful in your career so far. Have you met any skepticism or resistance along the way? And if you have, how did you manage to overcome that? Sorry, so you said, have you met any? Resistance or skepticism along the way? And if you have, how did you overcome that? Uh, so, Resistance. I've had, I really, I would say I've been lucky and, and blessed in my interaction with people and in, in, in science. The challenges in science do exist. I didn't talk a lot about uh, those. Maybe we can, we can talk a bit about that and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Uh, you can get to summarize that. But my approach has always been to to do and do others as it's done unto me, uh, or more or less 
like just do good uh the golden law of life and uh work with everyone give the best in any particular thing that i'm doing and get to look at the resistance and the challenges that come as as opportunities especially getting to for me if you look at my pathway has not been a typical pathway if you may and that has always come with its uh, challenges that okay you expected to uh really have a very very strong focus on one particular disease or one particular organism and just that particular research focus but i've not been uh focused on on that so my my, my approach has just always been to uh take things easy and just figure out ways around i think everyone can be you can always have a conversation with someone and uh, figure out a way around that okay and then um what advice would you give that to? Okay. I think your voice is not very clear. I'm no, I'm no, I hope, I don't know if my is the same oh, as okay. yeah. Uh, it's a bit the video is a bit blurred as it as it comes here. Yeah. Okay, I don't know, but okay. Uh, maybe we work with the questions in the chat box in the meantime. Uh, so Paul has a question. I'm not sure you can read it, right? Yeah. Uh, so having achieved all these amazing steps in your career, have you experienced burnout? And if so, how have you handled that? Yeah. That has been quite common. And I think I'll start with during my PhD, I was a workaholic, which meant that I would get to the lab at eight, go through the whole day until five o'clock, or more or less a lunch break, and go for it. Uh, yeah, so go for lunch, din dinner, come back to the lab. I would always get to the house at past midnight and for that led to at some point I think uh cut a bit and well but really it led to at some point you just realize that you are overworking and it doesn't always translate to productivity really uh, what it does is that it leads to you are doing suboptimal work if you're working 18 hours or 16 hours, you have suboptimal work over 18 hours, as opposed to, and I think when I got to my third year of my PhD, I changed that completely. No working over weekends. Uh, by six latest, I'm done with it. I'm going home and and cooking. Book around that time, I started just exploring uh, different South African recipes at that time. All my weekends, I was involved in in cycling, I would go cycling 40 kilometers and up the hills in, in South Africa. And also, the other thing I was also always never. So for me, working out, cooking, uh, having really great support system, I think I had amazing friends and I was doing my PhD uh, from across the, the globe. And then as well as just exploring, exploring my hobbies, cycling, uh cooking and hiking as well so we did a bit of that around that time so that's how i managed to to deal with that and it's continued with me even to to date most of those things i still still cycle i still go hiking and i still enjoy cooking uh the other question was from brian uh, university of uh, Rhodes University, does it offer structural and genomic bioinformatics or which field has it specialized in? So yes, uh, Rhodes University has actually specialized in uh, structural bioinformatics. Uh, but during my, so the, there are two, there were, my, my supervisor is now retired and I think right now Rhodes University is almost purely focused on, the bioinformatics program is purely structural bioinformatics. But at that time, uh, one of the areas was on genomics and the genomics area was more of regulatory genomics, which was being led by 
uh, my supervisor, Professor Philip Mechanic, are now retired. And that's how I got to explore that particular space uh, during my uh, my PhD. But uh, right now, the focus is really on uh, structural bioinformatics. Uh, another question from Brian. And when you are starting your bioinformatics journey, like taking your own personal reading and research, how exactly did you manage to get resources and materials? Maybe you can share some for some of us who are who are beginners. And all right, that's a really good question. At that time, actually, most of the resources that I used were textbooks. Uh, I would more or less look for PDFs uh, that were available openly in different topics. Uh, they were not so much in existence, and most of them I could, I got them from uh, my mentors and just general researching, depending on what I was interested in learning. But I would say at this point, there's so many resources that are available that can guide you when you're starting your journey in bioinformatics. So now like things like the carpentries, if you want to learn uh, programming, uh, you have Coursera. Coursera now, you have so many amazing uh, bioinformatics specialization. There's actually a full bioinformatics specialization, which has so many topics within it, from programming to machine learning, all the way to advanced uh, topics that you may be interested in. And therefore, venturing into bioinformatics right now is much, much easier. There's much more resources available. There's better mentorship available. Uh, there's so many people that are involved in that space. And I would say the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya is the one space that you can uh, get into and you'd get someone to assist you, someone to provide some uh, some guidance as you as you venture into that space. So as a beginner, there's always opportunities. Uh, Brian has raised up his hand also. Okay. Look, I had a question. Like, um, uh, it's like I'm doing. I have an interest in maybe pursuing my uh, pursuing a bioinformatics, uh, purely computational, at my PhD level. I'm um, currently a master's uh, degree student at uh, Jaikwat University, and uh, I would like to pursue PhD maybe in bioinformatics. So, uh, in my case, I wanted to really ask how well can I prepare maybe so that I can win a fellowship or uh, just convince a um, uh, postgraduate department that uh, I'm the suitable candidate because I'm planning to apply somewhere maybe which is not around and uh, I just want to maybe know exactly how well I can prepare before maybe uh, it's time and uh, I don't miss out on something that is really crucial. Okay. Uh, so Preparation is, one is when you have a very clear interest in that particular specialization that you want to undertake. It really starts there. It starts with why do you want to venture into that particular space. And if that is very clear in your mind and also uh, in your interest, then your preparation would show that. So one, getting to research that particular institution that you want to specialize. So if you want to specialize in, uh, let's say, specialize in purely computational or they have really rich computer science uh, specialization or machine learning or data science, then you prepare for that because you have an interest. One is because you've chosen that organization because it has what you want, right? They have a specialization that you're interested in. And therefore, what you'd have done is you'd have shown that you've prepared, you've learned the basic programming languages that are required in, in data science. Uh, you've also started taking a number of uh, courses, online courses in uh, data science, in machine learning and so forth. We should show the person recruiting that this is someone who is interested in this particular field and they have also done the work in preparing themselves to that for that specialization. So what supervisors always want to do is they want to see that you've shown initiatives they want to see the curiosity they want to see that you are able to learn and you would have to demonstrate that okay i think we have a couple more questions in the chat uh, 
So can there's you hear a... me now? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, John, uh, what would you do differently if you were to start all over again? Hmm. So depending on start at what point, uh, but I think I was, by talking to many people and learning from many people, I was able to really tailor my interest and my approach quite a bit. But I would say I would start much, especially with, uh, within the undergraduate, what I would change would be I didn't get to do a project because it wasn't a requirement at that time. And I remember talking to, because I really didn't get so much guidance at that time, but I wanted to do a project in bioinformatics. And it's, my struggle was, what does it entail? And getting someone to guide me in that direction. Uh, so I would say I would really do a project for my undergraduate in bioinformatics or uh, based on the various areas that I was involved in. Uh, the other thing that I would do within my PhD, yes, I would, I would slow down a bit and really uh, just grow technical skills in various spaces uh, that I needed. I was able to do that, but I would, I, would, I, would, I would do much more of that, especially in genomics. So uh, my going to look at the country, there's much more focus on uh, genomics uh, as opposed to uh, the structural or even gene regulation uh, aspect. So I'd get more in depth with within the genomic genomic space, and uh, I would talk to more people uh, about if I was to start all over again. But I've been I've been I've been lucky and in, grateful in, in, in my journey. Uh, with this great science journey, uh, that's from Brenda. How did you manage to remain motivated even when you first? You are faced with challenges. Hmm. How do you remain motivated? So, yeah. So during PhD is hard. <laughs> it's challenging, and uh, I remember some approach that I was because you're trying to develop a tool to to do something, and there was some approach that just was not working one objective that i had and exploring different spaces uh, statistical technologies just into some machine learning combining some data it wasn't working for a very long time actually i could really back my my brain for a really really long time uh, and how what I did was always I would step back and just get to something and it just becomes too difficult. I'll step back and just get to look for some small wins. <laughs> uh, just figure out a way to get some small wins that you can uh, be grateful about. So if you take, okay, let's step away from that. Let's focus on this particular aspect or let's write up this paper and just get that published. Uh, or just always, or just the yeah, that I'm involved in, just focus on that one. Uh, get some wind there. Um, of course, much later on was a lot of working, interacting with friends and just getting away uh, from that space and just talking to people who are facing the same challenges and just getting to know that it's not a problem with you. It's just science. It's research. You're trying to figure out something that no one has done before. And especially when it comes to PhD, it's original contribution to knowledge. You're trying to push you see a circle, PhD is about pushing that circle to expand it a little bit. Uh, and that means that it's hard. That's getting to know that it's going to be hard, that knowledge is important. And then now just looking for that support system to allow you to go through those challenges and ultimately look for small wins and celebrate them. Mm. Yeah, a number of other questions. Uh, so apart from biological aspects that Open Science Kenya offers, are there other tracks other than tech that other tech students or professional can participate in to build skills and more interaction as well as with the program? So uh, 
within so open science is actually really focused on uh, open science initiatives really in upskilling mostly biological students with uh, the computer science and data science tools so things like collaborations using git and github uh, more or less those aspects uh, upskilling in Linux and uh, some Python a little bit. So, and also I think would be of interest across across the board. Uh, but I'd say for most of these, there are lots of training activities that are already in place that uh, do offer uh, such. So just look, be on the lookout. And I think the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya is a good place to to look. Uh, the next question from Prince. Mine is a general question, not necessarily related to the field. How would you advise someone? working while undertaking graduate study studies uh, and how do we strike the balance um yeah i'm not the best person to answer this question <laughs> the reason for that is that i've always focused on one thing so when i was when i was doing my msc and phd that was all i was doing i did not get a job i everything else that I was involved in was just around that one aspect. So um, I would not be able to offer the, the best advice there. But I would say generally, from general knowledge, is get to know yourself. Don't bite more than you can chew. Uh, so really get to know yourself, know your abilities, know the kind of support system that you have, know the kind of demands that are there within your workplace and within your studies and ensure that your boss and your supervisors are really fully aware of what you're involved in and are able to provide you guidance based on that. Because if you are doing your studies and really they don't know or they don't realize that you are really involved in other responsibilities, then the demands that you would have would really be overwhelming. So getting to strike that balance with your with your mentors and supervisors is very, very important uh, after you know yourself. Uh, Paselli, what are the available career trajectory for bioinformatics, especially in Kenya and Africa? Are there job opportunities? Or rather with bioinformatics skills, what are the next steps to take? Uh, yeah, so I've been, I've been involved quite a bit in bioinformatics capacity building uh within the country and yes we've seen we've seen the growth in uh, especially with the COVID pandemic the the demand for bioinformatics or more or less with increase in genomic sequencing there's been a bit of an increase in demand for uh bioinformatics skills but what we're still missing right now within the country is that Various research organizations and institutions are yet to put a very strong emphasis on bioinformatics, especially in budgeting. And even when you're writing grant proposals, ensuring that they are budgeted for a bioinformatician. And therefore, what that what what happens there is that they end up being more dependent on students, which would have to learn and get to uh, produce results, or really depend on international collaborators, even if we have capacity within the country. So uh, my current uh, interest now is just having those conversations and figuring out how to increase the uptake. Because the need, you trust me, there's so many people who need support and help with data analysis and bioinformatics, but uh, most of them do not have the money to pay. And uh, that's really still the problem. So the demand is there. But I think it's just the, the institutional structures and budgeting that are not uh, well aligned to, to that. So I think it's the conversation and the change that we need to, to make within the country as we go forward. Um, so there's another question from Kalda. Uh, how do you always keep in touch with your mentor uh, to the best? Out, to get the best out of the mentor, especially those you're not working on any project together. Uh, let me see. So, one getting in the one thing is that 
make sure they are aware of where you are and what you're doing continuously. Uh, so keep them up to date, like just shoot them an email or, and you get a nice opportunity to shoot them an email and tell them, oh yeah, uh, right now, this is what I'm doing, this is what I've gotten. So for example, when I was in doing my PhD, MSc and PhD, I was not really involved in the CPA at all as much, but I was always, uh, any step that I take or the next step that I take, I'd always reach out to my mentors and just tell them, oh yeah, this is what I'm up to right now, this is where I am right now, this is what I'm learning right now, this is the kind of growth that I've gotten right now. And that would create an opportunity for them to uh, provide support and advice based on where you are and the information that you're sharing with them. Uh, the other aspect is just uh, once in a while schedule some check-in sessions with with them yeah, just to chat on, on various on various aspects. And I think as you go along, the mentors would change. Uh, the people around you, the people you are involved with, uh, would provide mentorship based on what you are doing at that particular time. Uh, so it's not something static that you should always be mentored by that person through and through, uh, but rather as you go along, as you have need, uh, they, will, they will always say as a student, when the student is ready, the mentor or the teacher will always appear. So when you're ready, when you have need and you are well aligned and you are always uh, making sure you, what you're doing is known, then uh, you'll be able to uh, get support and mentorship from those that are around you. Uh, so. Just make sure they are, they are fully aware of what you're up to. Make them aware of the successes that you've gained, especially because of their support and uh, guidance at the beginning. And just continue to reach out. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Caleb. I think we've run out of time. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story and also having this conversation with everyone here. And I hope everyone has benefited from this. And thank you all for joining the session. I think we have to take a bow now. Till next time. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for, for listening.